I am Sister Amara Burrell Williams, the wife of Pastor Kevin Williams Jr. of Greater Five Way Temple in Albion, Michigan. Just want to invite everyone to uh, listen in to our YouTube videos, um, the sermons and Bible studies of our beloved pastor, um, and invite you out to Greater Five Way Temple of Albion. It's 402. Um, Austin Avenue in Albion, Michigan, and visit our website. The link is below in the description.
were singing that song, Chasing After You. Mm. Um, the part that says, I'm praising my way through mm -hmm. just to be closer to you. Yes. I don't know if that's anybody's confession. That's probably all of our confession. But that's what it means to walk with the Lord. Sometimes you have to be intentional. And that was a blessing to me. Then going into grateful, my heart was just grateful. As I listened to you sing that song, I was just lifting my hands and, and I could just feel that thing in this place. I don't know about you, but I came here looking for something on tonight. And when I come and I sing or I do anything, I do it from the heart. I do it from the depths of my soul because I know that if it weren't for the Lord on my side, I don't even know where I would be. I surely, I know I would be alive today, but because of his grace and his mercy, we can stand here. So I'm excited to, to introduce my husband. Um, he's been here before. Um, to those of you who know him, to those of you who don't know him, he's my wonderful husband. We have six, listen, six kids. Hallelujah. So he's a father of six. He does an amazing job. He's our provider. He's our rock. He's a rock in our church to my father. We can depend on him. He's reliable. He lives his life with integrity. And this is something that we can say about him. We don't have to say it about himself. Everybody that knows him knows this thing. He's the same. Now if you see him in the street, very consistent. He loves God. He serves God fully. And I can reverend him because I live with him. So y'all, <laughs> let's put our hands together and receive Man, glory to God. I'm so grateful to be here tonight. And uh, I count it an honor and a privilege. Thank you so much, Pastor Kevin, for the opportunity to stand before uh, the congregation on tonight. You know, when a pastor lets somebody preach in his pulpit, it's a big deal. Amen. <laughs> it's a big deal. It's a big deal. So I'm grateful to be here tonight. And uh, we're, we're, we're not going to be before you long. But I do believe there's a word from the Lord. Amen. 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 Do we, does anybody have your Bibles with you? Come on, somebody say Bible check. Bible check. Bible check. Where the Bible's at? I see a lot of digital Bibles, but that works. That works. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And we're going to uh, read from the book of Matthew, chapter number 8. And I want to give honor to God, who's the head of my life, first of all. And give honor to all of the ministers of the house, the pastor of the house, and the first lady of the house. Amen. God bless you. And I want to give honor to my pastor, his absence, Bishop Carlton Burrell, all the way from Niles, Michigan. Yeah. Niles in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. And also, I want to give honor to my wife. She is just my treasure. Yeah, right. My treasure, right. my gift from the yeah. Lord. And I just yeah. love her dearly. Oh. And I'm grateful to God that he uh, gave her to me, he gifted her to me, because I really didn't deserve her. And, uh, you know, sometimes you'll hear me give my testimony, and I really didn't deserve a woman like the one he gave me. But somebody just say, favor ain't fair. Favor, favor. favor ain't fair. It's not fair. It's not fair. Glory to God. Um, so in the book of Matthew, um, I'm going to read, actually, from chapter number 8. Um, and I'm going to jump around a little bit. We'll dig a little deeper. Uh, but we're going to go verses 5 through 8. And then we'll jump to verse 10 and then verse number 13. If you got it, somebody say, I got it, preacher. I got it, preacher. Amen, amen. And it reads, verse number 5 through 8, it says, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. And then we'll drop down to verse number 10. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. And then we'll jump down to verse 13. We'll dig into it a little bit later. And it says, And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. Yes. And his Amen. servant was healed in the self-same yes. hour. Yes. The servant was healed in the self-same hour. And I'm going to use for a subject on tonight, everything is about to change. Yes. Somebody turn to the person next to you and tell them, everything is about to change. Yes. Everything. 
everything's about to change. Now turn to somebody else and tell them, today is your day. Because everything is about to change. Come on, let us pray together. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for bringing us together, God. We lift you and we magnify you and we give you glory. For you are the King of kings and you are the Lord of lords. You are Alpha and you are Omega. You are first and you are last. And we lift you on tonight and we give you all the glory, all the honor. We bow before your presence, God, and we ask that you show yourself strong in this place tonight, God. We welcome you in this place, God. Make us instruments of life transformation and use us for your glory, Lord. We ask that you have your way in this place, God. Bring deliverance and freedom in the name of Jesus. Bring transformation and change in the name of Jesus. We believe it and we receive it in the name of Jesus. And we declare that it is so. We bind every enemy right now, every adversary of the devil, everything that comes to cancel the move of God. We come against you with the power and the authority of the Holy Ghost. And we say, you have no dominion and you have no power in this place. We lift you, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Reverence your presence, God. We ask that you have your way in this place. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody shout amen. Amen. Y'all pray for me tonight. I don't have much of a voice. <laughs> I don't have much of a voice, but we're going to preach it anyhow. Amen. 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 So the subject is everything is about to change. Everything is about to change. And I was excited when Pastor Kevin gave me the theme for this weekend uh, because it's actually been my theme for my family for this entire year. And every year God gives me a theme for my family. He tells me what the climate of the year will be like for us. And, and how he's going to move in our lives that year. A few years back, God told us that it was the year of restoration. And I remember he began to bring some things together in our life. We were having some problems in our family. and We were, we were having some, some marital problems. And the Lord began to restore some things. The enemy will come and attack your marriage. And there was some, some cracks and some things broken. And God brought restoration in my family. And then uh, uh, shortly after that, the Lord, took, the Lord told me another year that it was the year of miracles. And I know that some of you may have heard uh, the story, but my oldest daughter sitting there with my wife, she's a walking miracle. God healed her multiple holes in her heart. He healed her from the crown of her head to the sole of her feet. Uh, uh, she was broken out with scabs and boils all over her body. She was not even recognizable that she was so covered. Her, all of her hair fell out of her head. She was bald, but somebody say, God did it. God did it. It was a miracle. And my wife sitting next to her, uh, I remember when she laid on her deathbed and the doctors told me to prepare to be a widow husband as she was giving birth to my youngest daughter there. And I watched the light drain out of my wife's body and we began to pray and we began to seek God and speak against the attack of the enemy. And somebody say, I got two miracles sitting over there. I got two miracles. And then another year, God told me it was the year of new beginnings. He said it was the year of new beginnings. And God began to make all things new in our life. I'm talking about uh, uh, new cars, new homes, new jobs. He began to give us a new way of thinking. He began to give us a greater and deeper relationship with him. He began to totally turn our whole life upside down yeah. because he told us it would be the year of the new beginning. And, and, and he began to just create everything new in our life. And it was just a beautiful thing. But then this year, the Lord told me, he said, this is the year of transformation. And I always have to explain it to my wife because she's always like, okay, if God told you that, I need you to elaborate. <laughs> but he said, this is the year of uh, transformation. And uh, this year, the Lord has began to do a new work in us. I mean, he's beginning to transform us from the inside out, internally, naturally, and spiritually. He's beginning to morph everything in our lives the way that it was before. And he told me from the beginning of the year that I'm going to transform your life so much that your family and your friends won't even recognize you. He said that you will be unrecognizable when I get done flipping your life upside down. 
And I looked up the word transformation, and it means to change thoroughly or dramatically. Now, this is interesting because this is the theme for this weekend. And I just wonder, does anybody in here need God to change anything dramatically in your life? I mean, can you do anything that you need God to do in your life? God said, today is your day. Everything's about to change. Somebody say, everything's about to change. Everything's about to change. Everything's about to change. So if we take a look at our text here, we have a centurion man who is a Roman pagan. He was not a Jew, but somehow he understood how kingdom works. This was a high-ranking official who had about 6,000 soldiers under his authority. I would imagine that considering his job, he probably already had witnessed Jesus walking through the land and doing things for people. He had witnessed the teachings and the works of Jesus, uh, considering his position. But what happened was now this pagan man had a problem that he couldn't fix. Now, with him being a pagan, everything that Jesus stood for was totally contrary to what he believed. But after seeing the Lord moving in the land, he, he decided that maybe I should take a look at this guy and see if maybe I can get some help. So his servant was at home sick. Now, this was a high-ranking official under Caesar. I'm sure he had plenty of money. I'm sure he had all the top-line doctors. I'm sure he had all the medicine. I'm sure he had everything perfectly laid out. As a matter of fact, considering he was a pagan, he probably had prayed to his pagan god. He probably did all types of rituals and sacrifices, but nothing seemed to be working. Somebody say, nothing was working. Nothing was working. Nothing was working. At this point, this man was desperate, he was hopeless, he had nowhere to turn, and there was no one that he knew that could help him. I wonder, has anybody been in a position where you felt desperate, where nothing that anybody could do seemed like it could help you? And all while, he was thousands of miles away from home. Thousands of miles away from home, at work. But his mind was still at home with his servant, stressing and worrying, trying to figure out what am I going to do. And much like the centurion, many of us are struggling and fighting with some things and we're desperate for change. Anybody desperate for change? Yes. 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 I wonder is there anybody in here tonight that has ever felt like the weight of the world was on your shoulders? You ever felt like there was just no way out and you were just so desperate and you needed God to do something for you. It's interesting because I look around at our church culture today and I know that some of us are sitting in the pews and we have problems and issues that we may not talk about. But in our church culture, it's amazing how God has given us access to the power for transformation. Yet, if you take a close look at some of our lives, we seem to not have tapped into any power at all. Uh, it's interesting. It's interesting. Uh, tell somebody, but something's got to change. Something's got to change. You see, I watched the documentary of an ex-warlock who got saved and is now a pastor. He stated that when he practiced witchcraft, uh, Christians were some of the easiest targets for him to target because most of them were weak and actually had no power. Wow. Tell somebody that ain't me. That ain't me. That ain't me. That ain't me. But Christians actually didn't have any power. So he could do whatever he wanted. And every now and then he would encounter one that had some power. And he said there was just a, a standard up against him where the Lord wouldn't even let him touch that person. And you see, uh, uh, now, um, Christians, uh, uh, I look around and I see that now we have so many false doctrines being preached and so many forms of godliness and, and now we got this new age spirituality movement and then I hear some of our Christian vocabulary being preached and, and, and taught outside of the church and, and now we have this manifest movement where people are trying to manifest everything that they want. But you see what's really happening is the enemy is trying to make the church seem irrelevant and weak and right, ineffective. Right, yes. For the Bible tells us that the enemy comes to kill, to steal, yeah, and to destroy. Lord. You see, he's tricked yes. many of us, and he has us faithfully sitting in the pews of the church, yet still bound by his stronghold. And it seems that now we've become conditioned to be comfortable while powerless. 
service. We become immune to the sound of preaching, looking for the musicians to play a certain beat or a certain tune that we can sing to or we can shout or we can dance as if we already had the victory. Uh, but if we were to tell the truth to one another, many of us have been coming to church over and over again, leaving the same way that we came, yeah. leaving church and still struggling with depression and anxiety yeah. wow. and worry and stress yeah. and regret and bad relationships and addictions yeah. and doubt yeah. and suicide yeah. and so much of the yeah. stuff. I yeah. wish I could get somebody to tell the person next to you that something has got to change. you, but if I could be honest about my own self, there have been times where I wanted to hold on to faith. There have been times where I wanted to believe what the preacher was saying. Times where I wanted to believe the scripture. <coughs> Excuse me, y'all. Praise the Lord. I'm going to preach this message. Yes. All right, all right, come on. There were times where I wanted to believe what the scriptures said. <clears throat> but somehow, the enemy continued to use my circumstances to keep me in a state of disbelief and a state of doubt. I remember hitting rock bottom. I was struggling so hard and losing everything that I had. No home, no car, no food, uh, no income. And, and, and no job, and, and, and I remember the feelings of despair and the feelings of hopelessness. And I was coming to church and pretending that everything was okay. I was putting on a smile, but as soon as I left the church, the smile quickly turned to tears. And I remember crying out to the Lord. <coughs> and I and, and and I used and I said, Lord, I know I made some mistakes. Amen. The devil is alive. Somebody give God a prayer. I remember crying out to God. And I said, Lord, why won't you hear my cry? Why won't you help me, God? I see it looks like you got they back over there, but how come you don't have my back? Yeah. And I wonder if there's anybody in here that had the same talk with God ever before. Oh, yeah. When you yeah. felt like your back was against the wall, and it felt like God didn't even have your back. Oh, yeah. But I came to let somebody know that even though some of us have come to church feeling weighed down, some of us have come to church feeling oppressed and depressed and, and hopeless. I came to let somebody know that God is saying, I heard your cry. Yes. God is saying, I heard your cry in the midnight hour. Yeah. And the Lord told me to tell you, Hallelujah. Thank you. Oh, that the seasons are changing. Yes. Yes. And this is the season of transformation. Yes. Tell somebody everything's about to change. Yes. Today yes. is your day. The seasons are changing. Yes. Let's take it back to the text just for a moment. So this pagan centurion then makes up in his mind uh, that this man Jesus could heal my servant. So he tells this Jesus that his servant was sick. Jesus says, well, I will go heal him. And the centurion says, well, I'm not worthy for you to come to my house and heal him. But the centurion says, I understand your authority. He says, I too am a man of authority, and I am up under Caesar. And even though I'm a thousands of miles away from home, if I send word and tell somebody to go, they're going to go. If I tell somebody to come, they're going to come. Hallelujah. If I tell somebody to do something, they're going to do it. And he said, I understand. Just like me, I understand your authority. And if you just speak healing, just like my words travel, your words will travel wherever you send them. And the Bible tells us that Jesus marveled at him and said, I've never seen such great faith. And in that same 
moment that Jesus sent the word of healing, the servant was immediately healed. The servant was suddenly healed. Somebody shout suddenly, suddenly. Does anybody got something that they need God to do suddenly, suddenly, suddenly? All you, all you gotta do is release your faith. I believe that this encounter now with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords has now changed the centurion forever. I believe that it changed the way he walked. It changed his belief system. It transformed his mind and every single thing about his life. So I begin to look at the scripture now. And the Lord began to deal with me. He showed me some things about myself as I read about this interior man. And he said, son, you need to stop all of your murmuring and your complaining. Because first of all, I put the power of life and death in your words. So if you continue to speak lack and defeat, then you will continue to bring life to all of the lack and defeat that's in your life. But if you learn to speak and expect my promises, no matter how the situation looks, your life will change forever. You see, the problem with many of us is that we don't actually have the faith in God that we talk about. God has given us the power and the authority to speak his word and to declare and to decree a thing, and it will suddenly come to pass. The Bible says that a man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. It says death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. That means that you shall have whatsoever you say out of your mouth. Yes. Glory oh, to God. Yeah. So there was a science experiment done by some school kids, and they took two plants, and they gave both plants the same amount of water, the same amount of sunlight. The only difference is one plant they spoke negativity to it for 30 days. The other plant they spoke uh, positivity to it for 30 days. And after 30 days, the plant that they fed negative words started to wither up. But the plant that they fed positive words was blossoming and blooming. See, even the world understands the principles of the word of God, but we sit up in church bound and we can't get nothing, we can't have nothing, we can't break through nothing because we don't live the principles of the word. But somebody shout, someone's got to change. Somebody tell the person next to you, don't you utter another negative word out of your mouth. Don't you utter another negative word out of your mouth. I don't care what the situation looks like. The Lord said in this season, this is the season where everything's about to change. This here is the season for transformation. And it starts with your confession. We must learn to speak life and pray in faith. more than I require of 
you. He said, many of us are not serious enough. God is saying it's time to be serious about everything that I've called you to do. The Lord said, remind them that everybody has a calling. He said, I called you to. Yes, you, everybody, I called you to advance my kingdom. The Lord said, I didn't create anybody or anything that was insignificant because I am an intentional God. And as a matter of fact, he said, you were fearfully and wonderfully made. He said, you are a masterpiece. He said, if you only knew your potential, if you only knew your potential, the Lord sent me all the way from Niles, Michigan to remind you that I have not he said, ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of man the things that I have prepared for you. God said, I am the Lord thy God, and I am able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all. 